Isabel is a piece that was uh, commissioned by the Austin Classical Guitar Society uh, for uh, Dr. Williams to, to compose for the Cavatina duo out of Chicago. Um, 
And this piece is rather interesting. It's, it's unique in that uh, even though it's a brand new piece, much like the Mountain Songs, it's, it's based on a, a very old piece of music. Um, the old piece of music that it's based on is a Sephardic Jewish tune from Spain entitled Dorme, Dorme, Mi Linda Doncella. Uh, the song is actually a relic of another rather uncomfortable time in history, that being the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, during the reign of uh, Queen Isabel, the uh, uh, Spanish government and, uh, and the uh, Holy Roman Catholic Church actually made a, uh, a new rule uh, in Spain, and actually across Europe, but mostly in Spain, that if you were Jewish and living there in Spain, you were not allowed to do that. Uh, you had three choices. You could either convert to Christianity, which would be the preferred method of fixing this problem. Uh, you could leave Spain entirely, or you could die. Those were your three options. Uh, the woman who this uh, piece is named after, Isabel, chose, like many Sephardic Jews did, not to convert, but to say she did. Okay? So she proclaims her Christianity before the authorities, uh, but before long she's found out. She's either informed on or they just look at her and they're like, you know what, I don't think you're actually Christian, and they throw her in prison. Uh, she eventually, while she's in prison, uh, is tortured and informs on her own family under torture, and her family is in prison as well. Uh, and eventually executed while she's still alive. And she's so ridden with guilt that she takes her own life while in prison. Um, it's not the happiest story in the world, but it's a very inspiring one. Uh, and in those times, particularly in the Sephardic culture, uh, that type of suicide was considered very honorable. Uh, I'm not suggesting that, you know, not, uh, now it's not, but uh, back then it was. So, Durme Dume, Mi Linda Doncella, or in this case, Isabel by Joseph Williams.
we have for you today is something completely different and should hopefully put you in a better mood. It is a piece by another American guitarist, Ian Krauss, written in 1985. Um, this particular piece is called Dakara, which translates to two friends in English. Um, it's happy, it's festive. It starts with sort of what sounds like an improvisation between the flute and the guitar, followed by an Irish march, and finally a very fast, happy reel. So this is Dakara by <coughs>
what? And did you just happen upon these in your life, or do you have like uh, someone in your life that brought you to, to like the this instrument kind of or to the music? More to the music. To okay, the so that's actually a really great question. So okay. a lot of times when I, how many in this room are musicians or have performed in recitals or ensembles? Okay, so a good chunk of you. So a lot of times. Um, it doesn't matter what genre of music you play, right? You want to pick a program that you enjoy learning, you feel that kind of grows you, um, helps you develop as an artist. And also, when we're considering it, because we do play classical music, and I don't know if most of you know this, but it's dying, right? So we want to have music that will connect with an audience. So I know when we put this program together, there was very much, it, it turns out that it's music of the Americas, but that's not why we, we put it together. We, we picked music that would feature each of the flute and the guitar as soloists and as chamber musicians. So you heard a lot of solo guitar stuff, there's some solo flute stuff. Um, and also things that would help us explore the different palette of timbres or colors that each of the instruments are able to produce. You can hear that in the guitar. Cindy sounds so much different than anything like Piazzolla or even what you hear in Beccara. And the flute, I mean, you have a range of crazy, like in, in Isabel, I'm singing and playing, I'm spitting into the flute, all same kinds of things. So we picked things that would help us kind of expand our color palettes as musicians that would also kind of flow. I think the program, it takes you from one place to another in sort of an organic way. And then also that would kind of connect with audiences. A lot of the people that we play for don't have any background with, with classical music and they already come in the room have deciding that they hate it. So the idea here is to pick a program that's accessible and that also anybody can appreciate, even if you don't know anything or you or you hate classical music. So. I think that for me was kind of put into that. I'm not sure. It's a, a, again a really great question um, that really opens up a lot of discussion. You know, um, but first I must take issue with the thought that classical music is dying. I mean, people have been saying that ever since the hurdy gurdy threatened to make the violin and feel obsolete. Yes. <laughs> but that's the that's the perception, right? Yes. Um, and and it's just not true. Uh, people like it. Uh, it's a, a, a real. Um, uh, uh, a real observation, you know, in the 1500s, the hurdy-gurdy came along, people were like, oh no, that's going to destroy music, and then the violin, you know, in the 1700s, and, and so on, but um, how we came to this music, there's there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different answers to that. Now, Dr. Bellatori's answer, of course, uh, is, is perfect. We're really looking for accessible music, and I think we found that in the tangos and the reels and everything else. Also, there's just not a whole lot of music out there originally for flute and guitar. We don't like to play arrangements. I don't like to play arrangements because um, they're usually harder than <laughs> the original thing. But um, so, if, if music is originally written for this instrumentation, it's generally a lot better um, than than arranging music or taking uh, other music. And when you have real composers, you know, like we have here, there's really no um, there's no hacks represented here. We have real composers in Piazzolla and Krauss uh, and then Joe. Um, so, you know, you can you can go through the limited amount of repertoire and find the gems, and that's really what we've done here. And, and in addition, this is a themed program. You know, we're looking for music from the Americas, uh, as this is a music of the Americas class, I believe. So, um, it just kind of like I mentioned before, it just kind of fit that program. Yeah. It, when we told uh, Isaac about it, it's like, oh, music of that. Oh, look at oh, that. Music North of the Americas. Americas. Well, that's ninety yeah, percent so, of what we play. Yeah. So. I guess we'll play everything but Tedesco and yeah. Locatelli and Vivaldi. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Other questions, yes. Uh, Paxton Riney. Yeah. Um, so you don't normally hear like the flute and guitar together as like an ensemble. So uh, my question is what brought you all together as like a, as a group? You're right. Like it's, it's not a really common kind of ensemble that you hear very often. It's kind of becoming more standard, but for it's not. So. Uh, John teaches at the UT Rio Grande Valley down in Brownsville, Texas. Texas Southwest College. Texas Southwest College, too. And I, up until this year, I was down there, too. And there's not a lot of opportunities to play with other musicians there, but there are tons of guitarists because they have a really great guitar program. So it was sort of proximity. We were there. He was a great musician. I, you know, I wanted to play with somebody who was, who was really good, and that's how we ended up playing together. Um, actually, I, it, when we started playing together, I was playing with somebody else who got sick and couldn't do a gig. And so John came in at the last minute. And I poisoned the other guitarist. <laughs> so, uh, and I was like, hey, he's really good. He's better than the one I played. So 
So um, they were both good. I, I like playing with John, so that's how mm -hmm. we became friends. Like, what was it, oh. five years ago? Yeah. Five years ago. Well, we went a couple of years where, where you were playing with that other guy. And then, yeah, so uh, in the last two, <laughs> two and a half years, we've been, three, three years, we've been playing together. And just it was really Isabel that, uh, that was the, the kicker. When that piece first came out, I wanted to play it. You know, and, and uh, so I, I sent her an email and asked, hey, uh, you know, send her the piece. And she said, sure, I'll learn Isabel. She'll learn the Beezer Mountain song. These are mountain songs because it looked about that thick and Isabel's two pages. So I was like, no, I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah. Lucas always wanted to play the mountain songs, but guitarists never do because yeah. it's really difficult. Um, and it doesn't sound difficult, but it is. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, the thing. That's uh, the thing. Yeah, so that's how we came together. So, okay, we'll go in the back, I guess. Uh, Steve, let's go. For me, it's a lot of listening. I listen to like a lot of tango music, not flute and guitar stuff, but just tango music, and a lot of Irish or Celtic music to try to get the sense of the sound in my ear, sort of um, the color of the instrument, and see if I can recreate it on the flute. Um, and that's my favorite part of making this kind of music come alive, is trying to find those sounds that are not always flute sounds. And sometimes you get really successful at it, and other times you're just like, oh, that, that didn't quite work. But for me, it's a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, can you repeat the question a little bit louder? I'm sorry. How, how do you guys break from the sound? And what's interesting is, um, thanks, that, that is a really good question also. What's interesting about that is that with tango, with the Irish music, um, you know, and, the, and the, the mountain song, for example, um, well, the mountain song's less so than the other ones, but really, it's not necessarily something that we did to take this music and make it classical music. History did that. You know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, if you take, uh, there's a, a great line from Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, you see this watch? It's worthless. You take it and bury it in the sand for a thousand years and dig it up and it becomes priceless. Right? It's kind of the same thing that's happened with tango music. Like tango music, used to, the, the first one that we played was Bordello. That's, that's written for a brothel. You know, because that's that's where tango music originated. It originated in the brothel, and now you have to pay fifty dollars for a ticket to go hear any good tango music and sit in a concert hall with your hands in your lap. You know, <laughs> um, so history has done that. I mean, tango isn't something that that's necessarily in those smoky bars anymore that that we had in the nineteen hundred and nineteen thirty. It's something that's that's on the concert <coughs> right now. Um, it's a little bit less so with the other styles, but you know, as far as making that music into classical music. We didn't really have to do very much with it. The composers did it, history did it. Mm 